So I'm going to map out some common experimental designs that you need to know about. The first is completely randomized. It's called that because participants are randomly assigned to treatment groups. So every stage, every split in the experiment is due to random chance. So this is where you have your sample. You've already collected your uh, individuals. Let's use an easy number. Let's say you have 100 individuals, right? And the first stage is you take a random number generator and you're going to randomly assign them into treatment groups. Now, I'm splitting into two, but you can have as many treatment groups as you want to compare. So, let's say this is group one and this is group two. You want those numbers to be roughly equal. They don't have to be identical, the, the same exact number, but they should be close. And then you want to randomly assign the treatment. So let's say this is treatment A and treatment B, and then at the very end you want to compare the results. So this is what a completely randomized design looks like. You start out with your sample, you use random assignment to put them into two groups, you apply a treatment, and then you compare the results at the end. The second common experimental design is randomized block design. This is where participants are categorized or stratified by a factor relevant to the study and then randomly assigned to treatment groups within each block. Start with your sample. Let's say again it's 100. And maybe you want to compare the effects of some treatment that you suspect might operate differently uh, based on gender. So males might respond one way and females might respond another way to whatever your treatment is. So these are called blocks. And I hope you spotted the difference between this and the last design. This first split here is non-random. So I did not use random assignment to say, okay, I randomly selected you to be a male and you're going to be a female, right? I'm splitting them based on a property that is inherent to the participants non-randomly, all right? So it's less likely that these are going to be the same number. Maybe I have 48 and 52. I'd like them to be close. Uh, but you may consider that when you're sampling. So you might do a stratified sample so that you have an equal number of males and females if you're thinking ahead. But if you have a sample of 100 people and maybe they were volunteers, so you get what you get and you don't get upset, right? Then you would take the 48 males and the 52 females or whatever the numbers are and you'd split them into their blocks non-randomly. Now comes the randomization. So basically within each block, I'm going to do a completely randomized experiment. So this is like a microcosm. It's basically two experiments in one. So this diagram is going to get a little bit complicated. But what I want you to notice is if you look back at the completely randomized design, I can kind of fit two of them on the board here. And that's what I'm going to do. So I take the males, and this becomes like my mini sample within a sample. And the first stage here is random assignment. So I'm going to randomly assign them to group and now I can split this in half and say 24 in this group, 24 in this group. Then I'm going to apply a treatment. I'll call it treatment A and treatment B. And then I'm going to compare the results at the end. And I'm going to do the same exact thing in the female block. Random assignment, group 1 and group 2, apply a treatment apply the other treatment. So here I could be comparing two treatments, or the second treatment could be the control group. It could be a placebo, or it could be no uh, treatment at all, depending on what the treatment is. And I'm going to compare the results of the females. And then depending on the study and whether it's appropriate or not, we could do a grand comparison at the very end and compare the results of the males to the females if it's appropriate, if it makes sense to directly compare the male's results to the female's results. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to directly compare the two groups. They may be completely separate, uh, but you may be able to, um, within each block, come up with uh, your own results for each of those blocks. So this is a randomized block experiment. It's a little bit more complicated. And again, I only did this with two groups and then two treatments here, but this can get pretty complex because you could have more than two groups, and then you could have more than two treatments also within each block. But this is the idea. The main difference to remember is, in a completely randomized design, the first split is random. In a block design, the split is non-random, the first split. 
and then you apply a randomized assignment. Okay, the third common example that I want you to know about is matched pairs design. And this one is not usually drawn out, so I'm just going to explain it. This is a special case of a block design, where the block only contains two individuals, each block, and you're going to have many, many blocks, all right? So it's a special case of block design in which either a participant acts as their own treatment and control, or else very similar participants, like identical twins or people that are matched on many, many measurements, are directly compared. This is really common in a pretest, post test situation. So look out for that. So in other words, if I want to try out my educational program and I give you a pretest, like a baseline, and then I test you at the end, a post test, I'm comparing your initial baseline score to your final score after the treatment. So you are your own control group and treatment group. Okay, so this is basically when there are two measurements from the same individual. So another example might be, um, I want to try out a tool and its effectiveness with my dominant hand and my non-dominant hand. So I'm going to do both of those exercises. I'm going to use the tool with each hand, and then I'm going to compare those, or the researcher is going to compare those, but they're comparing paired data, matched pairs. They're comparing my right hand to my left hand, not my right hand to some other person's left hand, okay, for example. So whenever you have two measurements from the same individuals, that's a matched pairs design. And another key thing to look out for is identical twins are used in research often because they're genetically the same. So they're often compared directly as if they were clones of each other. Now we could talk about the ethics of that, but we're not going to get into it. Um, so two measurements from each individual or two individuals that are very, very similar, matched on many things. Another example might be a participant is randomly assigned drug A or drug B and their heart rate is measured 15 minutes after. And then a week later, at the same time in the same place, they take the other drug and their heart rate is measured 15 minutes after and then the results are compared. That would be a matched pair. So two measurements, one individual. Okay, so here's an example. This is a question from 2019, free response. It's number two. I want you to try it first, pause the video, and then come back and we'll discuss it. Part A wants us to identify what are the treatments, what are the experimental units, and what is the response variable, right? Now, when you're answering a free response question, here's the key. I'm going to tell you the secret. The secret to answering free response questions on AP Statistics anyway is context. Context, context, context. It's everything. So don't give a general answer. Don't just write down the definition of what a treatment is. You want to mention or describe within the context of the problem, what the treatment is. So what is the treatment here? Well, you've got four concentrations of the fungus mixture, zero milliliters, 1.25, 2.5, and 3.75 milliliters per liter. Those sprays, those mixtures are the treatments, right? So there are four treatments here. So I would write something like concentrations of fungus mixture. Okay, and then I would actually list out those four treatments. So if there are four treatments, you want to mention them, okay, in the context. The treatment, remember what a treatment is, it's something that's being applied to the individuals in the study, all right, something that's being imposed to affect a hypothesized response. Okay, what are the experimental units? Now, this is a tricky one. Experimental units usually are people in a study, individuals, okay, but here, what is the smallest group the treatments are being applied to, right? Are they applying treatments to individual um, insects? And the answer is no. They're applying the treatments to containers. There are 20 containers and they're spraying all insects in the containers. So believe it or not, the experimental unit here is a container of insects. And then they're going to count the number that are still alive. So it's not actually individuals here. So units is a tricky word here because unit usually means one, but here it means one container, not one insect because we're not spraying individual insects. We're spraying groups of insects at a time. We don't actually know how many are in these containers if you read the question. But the definition of an experimental unit is the smallest group to which a treatment is applied. So here that would be an entire container at once, at a time. What's the response variable? So what are they measuring? Now this has to be a variable. So don't write something vague like 
bugs that are alive. It's the number of insects that are still alive because they're counting them. So you want to include words like number, frequency, mean, standard deviation, proportion. Okay, what are they actually measuring? So here they're measuring the number of insects still alive. And do they give a time period? One week. These may seem like easy questions to you, I don't know, but you have to write complete sentences and you have to use the context. And if there are units, use units. And don't do what I just did here. Do what I say, now what I do. List out all four of those treatments. Part B says, does the experiment have a control group? Explain your answer. So the control group here is the group that gets zero milliliters per liter. That's no fungus. Right? So I don't know, maybe they are spraying water to see if the effect of just being bombarded with some liquid uh, has some effect. They didn't say that, but that might be a smart thing to do. But the control group here is the fungus mixture containing zero milliliters per liter. In fact, now that I think about it, they're creating four different concentrations of fungus mixtures. They probably still are spraying, but it has zero milliliters per liter of fungus mixture. In it. So that would be the control group. And when it says explain your answer, you have to write a complete sentence. So you would say what I said in words just now. Part C wants us to describe how the treatments can be randomly assigned to the experimental units so that each treatment has the same number of units. So there were 20 containers, there are four concentrations, so uh, five containers are going to get each level of those treatments, right? So how do we do the random assignment? That's what they want to know. So you can't just say what I just said, which is five are going to get zero, five are going to get 1.25, five are going to get 2.5. How do you actually randomly assign them? So there's a couple ways to explain this. One is you could put 20 slips of paper into a hat and the first five that you pull out are the containers that will get zero. And then the next five, oh, you have to number the containers obviously first. So I would start with numbering the containers one through 20, put slips of paper in a hat, the first five that you pull out get the first treatment, the second five you pull out get the next treatment, the third five you pull out get the third treatment, and the remaining five get the final treatment. So that's using a pull out of a hat method. Uh, the more high tech method is number them one through 20 and then use a random number generator to generate five numbers without replacement. Those first five will get zero then randomly generate another five and ignore any repeats, right? That's what I mean by without replacement. So don't replace them back into the uh, number bank. Um, the next five will get the second treatment. So you just want to write out that in a sentence or two, that you want to number all of the experimental units and then use a random number generator or use slips of paper out of a hat to generate five numbers at a time that receive each level of treatment. I hope that makes sense. Thanks a lot for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And as always, may the math be with you. With you? With you. May the math be with you.